Hi everyone, and welcome to our webinar, What Managing 10 Million Hours of Products Taught Me About Roadmap Execution. My name is Rihanna. I'm the Content Marketing Specialist at Gainsight, and I hope you're all as excited about this webinar as I am. Before we get started, I've got a couple housekeeping items to cover. Number one, the webinar is being recorded, and you will receive the slides and the recording before the end of the day today. Second of all, we'll be saving a few minutes at the end of the webinar for questions, so if you have a question, please submit it on the questions tab in your GoToWebinar panel, and you can do this throughout the webinar, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. I am so thrilled to have Becky Flint with us today. Becky is the co-founder and CEO of Dragon Boat, a smart roadmap planning, smart roadmap platform built on her learnings leading 10 million hours of product roadmaps. You'll be getting a taste of those learnings in today's webinar. Prior to Dragon Boat, Becky held executive roles at Feedseye, BigCommerce, Shutterfly, and PayPal. She is also an advisor and investor to many startups. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to her. Becky, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, hi, Rihanna. Thank you so much for the intro. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Hi, everyone. I'm Becky. Um, Rihanna, can you go to the next slide, please? Thank you very much. Um, so I'm very excited to share uh, my learnings from leading product executions in startups and scale up. And I also equally as excited to learn that from you. So we sent out the poll before the meeting and hopefully you can also fill them out throughout. Thank you for some of you already filled it out. And if you have any more questions, would love to hear from you as well. So before we started, I just want to clarify, since we can see each other, that I'm actually not 10 million hour old. That's about 1,200 years. So uh, I was lucky enough to be able to parallel this with the hundreds of teams to fit that into my 18 years career. <laughs> so jokes aside, um, I was very lucky to join PayPal in its earlier days and it was a part of the journey leading PayPal global expansion from five countries to more than 200 countries. And later on, I was also leading PayPal and established the portfolio roadmap process for PayPal and took that uh, learnings and into a couple of other companies, uh, including Shutterfly, BigCommerce, and Fizai. And my learning not include my personal experience, also include a lot of uh, direct uh, learning and mentorship from my colleagues as well. So today we're gonna touch upon some of them and hopefully we can bring away some of the learnings that will be helpful to you as well. So without further ado, uh, Rihanna, next slide, please. The interesting thing is that companies, the big and small, all face similar challenges. And that even reflected on not only the product management inside report come out this year, also the surveys I got from the members already filled out. The lack of resources, competing demands, and disconnect on strategies are sprinkled all over the place. So next slide, please. Now, teams handle this differently. Some team will have a disconnect of a strategy cycle and an execution cycle. Some teams would just smash these two into the same place that cause obviously a lot of confusion. The winning team handle them into two distinctive roadmap planning process. We call it a responsive roadmap planning process, which include a strategic cycle and the execution cycle. They're interconnect and iterative, but they're not smashed together. They're not disconnect. Um, next slide, please. So as you can see in a company, we're at every level, there are different level of operation. At a different level, we all have strategic cycle and execution cycle. The responsive process connect not only at the same level uh, and, and also multiple levels as well, where the companies facing challenges are, could be disconnect at a, either cross level or on the same level. The next slide, please. So what responsive roadmap being entails? It has three unique characters, characteristics. One is a multi-factor evaluation. That is um, the opposite of what we get in terms of one score on uh, evaluation. It takes a portfolio approach 
which is uh, does not regardless the size of your product line or roadmap or even where you are in terms of your product journey i'm sure many of you in the audience it could be at a different phases of your product management career but portfolio approach actually apply to wherever you are and then the, the last but not least is more, which is a metric over available resources to address the contention. That is um, different from the traditional RI based uh, contention measures. So we're gonna double click on all of them in the following um, conversation. Next slide, please. So here is a, a typical, this is an actual roadmap. And a typical roadmap goes like this. You have a list of features, you prioritize them, and then you have the resources listed on there. And then when we go through the list, we run out of resources, we draw a line, and that everything above line will be done. And everything below the line will be deferred. The next slide, please. So what is wrong with that? So we take one step back. We realize a lot of time product teams spent with the stakeholders is really trying to justify and debate and uh, discuss on why some things is higher on the list and why some things are lower on the list. And the score could not explain very well the decision behind it. The decision is actually very complex. So if we take one step back to think about it, the score really is, a, is to compensate our human brain's limitation of handling more than seven or so factors at once in our head. So we created this score, we debate, and we spend a lot of time on the formulas, the allocations, et cetera. But when we put them out, it does not explain itself. Which we really do is to take the, the rational behind the score and lay them out on paper, so to speak. In this case, it has the segments and the metrics, two simple ones. And you know, obviously, based on your, your roadmap, it could change. When we lay them out, realize that we missed international and the partner and then we missed acquisition that even the the team coming together put the score didn't realize the miss that obviously this will cause our stakeholders to be uh, not excited about their elements of, of a factor uh, being missed from the roadmap so um next slide please so here is um, an example of a complex roadmap would include a lot of uh, factors, which is back in the days of PayPal um, global expansion. When I joined PayPal in the earlier days, uh, PayPal was fully operating in five countries and the growth of international expansion caused a lot of excitement and newer countries be identified, offices were formed and create those, uh, we call it a country manager who are basically GMs of the country. And after a lot of the work to set up the operations, et cetera, the next thing to do is to launch PayPal in these countries. As you can imagine, all these country managers would flew into um, San Jose headquarters and they literally uh, pounding the doors of the product teams and the lobbying for their countries to be launched next. So not only the countries that weren't launched, not only the countries that weren't launched yet uh, are coming here to lobbying, there are countries that are already launched. The country manager also came here to lobby for their countries to be on the list, to build new products, uh, to uh, deepen the engagement and drive profitability, et cetera. So there are so many factors coming into play. You can imagine the excitement and the debate and you know, agony between different teams. So what did we do? So next slide, please. So here is uh, sort of the first set of the countries that I was involved in. Um, it was kind of no brainer to launch Australia because at that time Australia was the largest, the market hasn't launched yet. And um, the debate was very much about Hong Kong, which on itself, it's a very small market domestically. However, it has a much bigger uh, strategic impact, both in terms of open up the market in, the, in Asia, as well as the large uh, portfolio benefits in uh, the cross-border trade. So 
Hong Kong, as the result, as we're looking at the different factors that are driving prioritization, Hong Kong was actually put on the list as the, the next one, even though it has a smaller uh, market size uh, compared to other competing countries uh, on the list. The other part of that, which we'll talk more down the road, is that as we look at the benefit factor, we also look at the resourcing factor. We realize that there are different resourcing conflict we can actually stagger. So as we lay on all these factors being con considered, um, basically on paper, we were able to stagger the country launches and be able to pull the countries that seemingly look smaller ahead. And this is where it comes through. So next slide, please. So the second one is the portfolio approach. Um, next slide, please. So when we talk about a portfolio with the product managers, a lot of times they would say, I only have one product line. I don't really have a portfolio. And that's actually not quite, if we think about a portfolio in a slightly different dimension in terms of a, a uh, opportunity to invest, almost like your retirement portfolio. So even if you are a single PM, then obviously if you're a director or, or PM at the multi, you know, multiple teams, you would have a different opportunities to invest in. So think about your roadmap as a portfolio. And when it comes to portfolio, allocation actually matters a lot. And uh, one of the example is that in every single portfolio, there is a risky allocations that we call the innovation. And there's also optimizations or growth, which is to make a current product and better and expand that, right? So a lot of them really related to getting data, get a customer request. So the risk, risky allocations are the ones that would otherwise never be sort of above the line because they don't drive as much benefits. They cannot compare to what existing product would be. So let's use this another example to illustrate this. So next slide, please. So in here, uh, this is a case study about PayPal merchant services, where earlier in the day in PayPal, um, in about 2003, 2004, um, PayPal only took about two to three percent of the SMB marketplace for payments, so small, medium-sized business. Majority of PayPal's business actually came from eBay. Uh, it was a, a eBay account for more than 75% of, of the PayPal um, revenue. So um, when, when, the, when merchant services team started to have some, when merchant service segment started to have some adoption by, by the market, the product team started to realize that, hey, that is an opportunity there. But there was a very strong um, debate on should we invest in this space? Um, payment is a high risk, low margin business. eBay is a high margin. By the way, that PayPal was part of eBay back then. So eBay is a very high margin, high growth business back then. If there is cannibalization of invest in merchant services, because the more merchants sell off eBay, not on eBay, the less eBay will get its business. So there is a, a cannibalization at the portfolio level. And also from an uh, outcome level, if, when we put a small dev days, two, three weeks of dev days uh, on, on the eBay features, we, were, we would be driving you know, millions of uh, revenues or profits. Put it on the merchant services, we would get almost nothing in return. So there's a lot of debate on that, but the pro team uh, you know, very folk, uh, insist on this is a possibility that uh, merchants could grow their business and not on eBay, and that eventually will turn into a profitable business for us, and we're also gonna take the market share. So a very, very small team was formed, and you know, fast forward today, 2018. If we look at then, 2004, uh, merchant PayPal was taking about 3% of market share. 2018, that's 60% of the market share. Back in 2004, um, eBay accounted for 75% also PayPal's revenue. And in 2018, 
that number shrunk to about 13%. Not only the number shrunk to much smaller, 13%, eBay actually also announced that PayPal would not be a preferred payment provider. That announcement came out in 2018. Imagine if the risk bet wasn't taken back in the day, what would PayPal be today? So when we look at our roadmap, we always try to optimize getting feedback and improve our conversion and drive outcome. And what really equally and sometimes even more important is to see what new opportunities that would be a risky bet, but it would actually drive us the sustained growth. And that is the part where I think for product team, our learning and you know, PayPal has done this many, many times over, obviously international expansion, merchant service, next one, credit. And that's always uh, trying to protect that risky bed so that your portfolio could grow over time. Okay, so this is a um, more to address contention. And so traditionally, um, we use something called an ROI, return on investment. And that's really team use it across the board to prioritize the features. So what is the challenging of use this method, especially in today's world when we talk more about software, we talk about the people versus the, the ROI was really back in the days of manufacturing the machines and, and things that we can easily buy, is that today dollar does not give us the ability to produce the product we actually need to take to market. So think for a second, um, there are more than half a million jobs uh, and field in the market today. And um, give us dollars doesn't really give us any outcome. On the other hand, the return has many ways to, to measure, especially in the growth areas we have today in the group. The return could be in the form of referrals, user growth, it does not necessarily translate to revenue. So that's why we really believe um, changing this ROI dollar-based thought framework and then move it to a, a more based framework, which is a metrics based framework, really give us a way to look at our portfolios, look at our roadmaps, look at our products, to think about how do we um, evaluate them. So um, obviously you can just do this on spreadsheets, you can do this on sticker notes or you know, put people in the room to debate and uh, you know, like what I have done. And you know, that also is time consuming, it's hard to review. That's the main reason, one of the main reasons I created Dragon Ball so we can actually see when it comes to contentions of a list of the features, where they are, what resources they are compete against, so we can prioritize um, between them. This one actually really tie back to the earlier ones that we talk about uh, in, the, um, in the PayPal international country launch use case where we were competing two sets of different resources at the same time. The initial country launch were competing against one set of the resource team, and then the other one actually compete against, so the, the, the new features are competing against a different set of the teams. So we were able, able to separate them out and allow us to go to market much, much faster. There's another very interesting fact about this one is, if the contention, the competition for the same resources and falling to the area where there's no competition for reasons due to the fact of the requirements of the product, we could move this product uh, sooner than some of the low, priori uh, low priority uh, product features. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So um, this is putting the very various pieces together into a responsive row mapping. Um, as you can see here, the example we talked about early on, the list of features is the same, but in terms of prioritization, we have, instead of using prioritization scores, 
we have we are using the strategic factors that feed into these scores and as we're looking at this multiple factors for the strategic benefits we can see the gaps the original plan was causing us right the international partner acquisition so looking at the other elements of that is to see the resources instead of using effort as the individual number we actually see the breakdowns of the effort across multiple teams and as you can see on the platform teams we have actually more resources to do even more than what is on this list however on the web team we run out the resources before we even get down to the further product and um, you know going back to some of the uh, survey members did before the session again thank you for doing that um, every single person fill up the survey call out that to deliver their roadmap they need more than just their team they need multiple teams and this is what happens this is a multi-team scenario so instead of, of treating each line items individually we actually looking at them across the board as as we look at this we realize hey what if as a portfolio we take these three items below the line and move them above the line because they re as, uh, um, collectively they produce better outcome they cover the gaps in the strategic factors that matter to us at this point in time and they require same set of the resources if you add up the total then we're looking at a completely different construct of what this roadmap looked like so so this is the three elements of the responsive roadmap being multi-factor and uh, evaluating different strategic benefits and the portfolio approach which will look at the multiple items uh, against one or multiple items versus one against another and across the allocation of different metrics that matters to us and then also we use metric over available resources at a dimension that matters in terms of execution itself so this is a very immediate outcome of using this approach. There is a slightly longer term outcome looking at this is we can see the platform team could do more or they have more capacity resources than they are demanded for, but the web team seems to be very much in shortage almost all the time. They are the bottleneck team. And you know, what is, you know, at the portfolio or leadership level what should we look at this and decide the construct of the team to help us to you know more opportunity to produce uh, to bring the the product to market is to really potentially augment or hire faster in the web team that would allow us to deliver more because they're the, the bottleneck team so um, um next slide please Now, um, we kind of went through very quickly um, a couple of things about the responsive roadmap being. And it is very helpful. It really transformed the companies that I worked at in terms of not being able to ship product due to various blocking factors to be able to ship product much, much faster uh, and be able to unlock the, the blockage or the bottleneck teams so that we can join team together to ship product features faster. But that is a lot of work. <laughs> we call it a spreadsheet help. So that's the main reason I started the Dragon Boat, really not only taking the learnings and principles of the responsive role mapping, which takes strategic cycle and execution cycle, connect them together and provide alignment and visibility and allocation at the portfolio roadmap level uh, so that we can um, take what we have and be able to look at our portfolio allocation and align to strategic factors to be able to uh, ship the product faster. So um, before I open up to q and I just want to call out we have a special promotion for the product managers, med managers here and sign up um, and by next week um, 10 million hours of uh, roadmaps at the uh, um, 
um, app.dragonboat.io slash 10 million hours. Um, would love to hear from you guys as well on is this helpful, what you learn, your challenges are, and how you go about solving those challenges. Okay, Rihanna, back Great. to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Becky. I really appreciate you coming on today and sharing that with us. So I do have a few questions here, and just so everyone knows, the question panel, um, the question section in your GoToWebinar panel is where you will submit your questions, and we'll go through them. I've got a few here for you, Becky. So let's start with this one. So how do you integrate the custom, customer feedback in this responsive road mapping process that you just um, outlined for us? Yeah, great question, Rihanna. Thank you for asking. So if you look at this double diamond, there's a go-to-market on, on, on the end of the execution cycle. There's also market inputs at the beginning of the uh, strategic cycle. So customer feedback gave us two forms. One is the feedback, it's very tangible. It's something that we can do and improve, we can iterate on. That's, you know, everyone's very familiar with, you know, Lean Startup, iterate and learn. Etc. So these are the go-to-market and the feedback come back to execution cycle. It, it, it's not required. Everything has to go through the whole process, right? Something we know for sure we can improve on. We can work on this already. Now, there, the longer form of a market input, on the other hand, gave us a different view, which is what are the underlying trends that the data and the customers are telling us or maybe they're not telling us, but we're seeing. So we incorporate customer feedbacks in two ways. One is a very clear feedback. We know what you do. It's almost like, I do not want to use the word reactive, but in some ways we respond very quickly. Some of other underlying things are not very clear to us. It's a fuzzy, but we can see there's a trend. There's things that are not clearly articulated but we can see that's opportunity. So examples of you know, the merchant services example that I used earlier, those will become the inputs will drive more strategic thoughts and debate uh, before we going to, to just do it, so to speak. Awesome, thank you. So yeah. we have another one. How do you weigh the metrics against one another for your scoring? How do you weigh, um, like, how do you compare one metric and how is that one more than another? What's, what's your uh, thoughts behind that? Yeah, actually, very excellent question. The, the answer is you can't, but you can vary the allocation. So, you know, at the very broad level, uh, most of the teams or companies are dealing with acquisition, conversion, retention, you know, maybe some sort of efficiency and a cost reduction, things along these lines, right? And that fluctuates. That's why we call this responsive roadmap is by looking at the state of the business and our product itself, we will have more focus in one area versus the other. So for example, we could be very much focused on acquisition in maybe two quarters ahead, uh, two quarters before, because you know, obviously we want to have more leads, be able to focus on that. Now, two quarters later, one quarter later, we have enough acquisition. We realize the bottleneck to the growth or the adoption, it's no longer acquisition, it will be conversion. So now we will focus more on conversion, but we will not give up acquisition completely because otherwise we have to go to this sort of very jerky shape of moving things around. So it will be something more like a allocation base. So we'll say, let's say we spent you know, 75% on retention, maybe 20% on acquisition. And you know, so things like um, the, as the company moves and, and we do this cycle on where's the bottleneck, where we focus on more, but we will not drop the other thing around. That's why it's called a responsive versus we have a set of metric and kind of stick to it. Awesome, thank you, Becky. So we're getting okay. some more. So how responsive should this be to test? Um, how long is a cycle? Is it a week or is it a month? Yeah, uh, excellent question. So there are a few ways to do this. Um, so uh, earlier in one of the slides, we talk about at a different uh, level of operating. Uh, we have a slightly different time frame, right? At the individual team level, we talk about the weeks as execution or sprints, if you will. And then we look at, you know, probably months 
uh, as the um, as strategic cycle. Uh, so when you at a different level, you think it's slightly differently on your day to day. But at the company level, what you typically do is really tied to your your business. If if you're in the business that's a fast moving, that's consumers and market reactive, that you would be you know a lot faster time frame. We talk about maybe month, right? But if you're in a business that are relatively complex in the B two B, that your partners or your customers are moving slow, you don't get fast enough of feedback and turn around. Then you would have a relatively slower cycle to be in sync with the market you are in. So typically, if I were to say, it's like if you're in a consumer, we're talking about a month or two, uh, as a strategy cycle, execution cycle, obviously it's like, you know, you can go days or, or sprints. Now for, uh, for the enterprise and, and the more complex market, we're talking about quarterly or slightly longer, and then your execution cycle is probably, you know, uh, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Great, thanks. The next question. Um, so how would you approach road mapping like this from a pre-product market fit product line? Oh, that is an excellent, excellent question. So um, pre-product market fit, uh, it, so it, it basically you condense this to much smaller time frame for pre-product market fit because obviously we have to build product we take to the market to see your action and then we would we we'll strategize say what we focus on and um, so when we say um so two, two things one is that when you have a pre product market fit you will define your goals very differently you probably will have a primary goal which is finding people adoption versus if you're in an existing business, you have competing goals, adoptions versus you know, monetization, all the other stuff, right? So it's a little simpler. So your strategic cycle will be more focusing on breaking your adoption into a couple of elements. And then your execution will be focusing on things you can do aligned to these elements. You almost can, like if you visualize that, it will be like uh, you have, two or three lanes of your strategic focus or hypothesis. And then you put your product features along each one of those, you know, three, four lanes, and then you build them, and then you go out to see how the market react to it, and then you come back to it. So it's almost like a very close together strategy, strategic and execution cycle. The only difference is the PM will think more about the strategic side of things before you go to engineering, and so that you can be more focused on one thing at a time, not two things at once. I hope that answered your question. I think that was great. So I'm going to, I think this is good, this is fantastic. We're getting a lot of good questions. So thank you everybody for sending those in. Um, if anyone has any questions after the webinar, just be, just send them over to Becky at the email that she's provided, becky at dragonboat.io. And we are going to wrap it up here. Thanks again for everybody for showing up today and watching. And thank you so much, Becky, for sharing this awesome information. So stay tuned for our next webinars coming up. And um, have a fantastic rest of your day, everyone. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure.